Welcome back everyone. Um, in this video, we are going to talk about the fast equilibrium approximation. So this is another approach for dealing with intermediates that appear in the rate law as we are deriving it from the, from the mechanism of elementary steps. And um, in the last video, we talked about the steady state approximation and we showed that there are points where the steady state approximation fails. And so when the steady state approximation fails, the fast equilibrium approximation is one that we can apply to take over to see if this one gives us a better result. Okay, so I'm going to continue working I'm going to continue working with the same reaction mechanism that I did in the um, steady state approximation. Because it turns out that any reaction mechanism that we use, that we apply the steady state approximation to, we can also apply the fast equilibrium approximation. And the question is always going to be, which one which approximation gets us closer to the experimental result? Okay, so again, to start this off, we find the rate law based upon the rate determining step. And for this case, that is that the rate, the change of the concentration of water with respect to time, is equal to K2 times the concentration of H2 times the concentration of N2O2. And so this N2O2, it is an intermediate. And that means that we have to work to figure out an expression for this concentration that involves only reactants or products so that we can remove this presence of the intermediate from the rate law. So with this approximation, what we are going to do is we are going to assume that equilibrium is of this first step is established quickly. And so that is the case when K minus one is much faster than K two, or when K two is much slower than K one. And so these are the conditions when the steady state approximation is going to fail. So in this case, what we do is we define this equilibrium constant. And we know that that is defined as the concentration of the products over the concentration of re the reactants raised to these stoichiometric powers. We also know that this equilibrium constant is equal to the rate of the forward reaction divided by the rate of the reverse reaction. And so we can set up this relationship when we have a fast equilibrium system. And that allows us to solve for the concentration of the intermediate based upon that definition of equilibrium. So once we have solved for the concentration of the intermediate, we can then plug it into our rate law expression and give us our final derived rate law. Now, with the steady state approximation and the, the same reaction, we found that our concentration, that our rate is equal to K1, K2 over K minus, 
k minus 1 plus k2 times the concentration of H2 times the concentration of NO. And so this, with the, set, with the steady state, is a second order reaction. With the fast equilibrium, this comes out as a third order reaction. because we have first order in terms of hydrogen, second order in terms of NO, and so my overall order is going to be one plus two or three. So if we wanted to distinguish between which approximation is the most valid, we would either need to find our values for our rate constants for each step, or we would need to measure this overall order of reaction and determine if, and really we could, would do this by changing the amounts of NO in our system and determining if our nitrous oxide behaves as a first order or a second order reaction. And based upon experimentally how the NO behaves with figuring out the, with collecting data of the concentration of NO versus time and graphing the natural log and 1 over and saying which is linear, if we do that, we can experimentally support one of these approximations over the other. But without that experimental comparison to the rate law, it's hard to say which one of these is more valid. So if we ask, is this approximation valid? It turns out that it's decent if we are in the condition where k minus 1 is much bigger than k2. And so to do that, this graph is giving us the reaction that's very similar to the one we've been working with. And our concentrations of A, C, and D are graphed, and these are experimental. and predicted are the primes. Oh, and we don't have the C primed. And so we can see in the graph that when we compare, that was the wrong color, when we compare our reactant concentrations over time, and our product concentrations over time. We can see that there are some deviations between the prediction and the experiment. But overall, this prediction is doing a pretty good job. Um, it's much better than if you remember this condition whenever this graph, whenever we had this condition on the steady state approximation. So it turns out that this fast equilibrium is a decent way of going about figuring out these, these more complicated reactions. Um, they have to be validated experimentally, and being able to predict which approximation to make is really tough in experimental conditions. But, um, and... Ultimately, both of these are appropriate under different 
under different conditions and under different individual rate steps that are happening within these reactions. So really, we have to understand our reaction, we have to understand our rates, and we have to understand how things are behaving experimentally to really determine which approximation we need to apply under which conditions. Now, I don't want, these are the only two approximations that we are going to cover this semester. I don't want you to think that these are the only two approximations. Um, it turns out that I have textbooks of chemical kinetics and there are chapters upon chapters of different types of approximations and different ways to handle these complications of intermediates. Um, as well as other more complicated reactions. So these are two very common, very useful approximations, um, but we have to be careful and not overuse them and not apply them in conditions that um, where they are not valid.